Okay, so this is some video notes on section 7.2. Today we'll be talking about transcription and gene expression. So we will spend some good amount of time talking about how DNA information and DNA is actually used to create mRNA and then how that mRNA gets prepared to go through translation, which is when protein is produced. However, a good part of this PBT will actually be about the regulation of transcription. Since transcription is the first step to take information out of DNA so that it can be used by a cell, uh, transcription is the first point of regulation. So we're going to see what can in increase the chance of transcription and what will also decrease the chance of, tran of transcription. <laughs> So we'll be talking in general just about how transcription occurs. We'll spend a lot of time talking about how it's regulated and how nucleosomes will play a role in this. Uh, we'll talk about eukaryotes versus prokaryotes, and we'll kind of compare how eukaryotes and prokaryotes regulate their transcription differently. We'll be talking about how mRNA is prepared through the process of splicing, and we'll talk about uh, transcription factors and other proteins that help uh, increase or decrease the rate of transcription. We'll reflect a little bit on how environmental factors can also be affected, can be used to, or will have an effect on transcription rate. Uh, and then we'll also talk about DNA methylation and acetylation and compare how the patterns of methylation and acetylation also can influence the expression of genes and ultimately maybe influence uh, how someone develops as the different parts of their DNA are used more than others. So uh, when we first we're going to do is we're going to talk about transcription regulation in prokaryotes and then later we'll get into eukaryotes. So if you remember prokaryotes, those are our bacterial cells, our simple forms of life. And the interesting thing about prokaryotes is that prokaryotes uh, really have um, all of their genes that are important are all located next to each other. All the things that make a protein are all going to be right next to each other. If you remember introns and exons, all right, from an earlier PPT, so introns are the parts of the DNA that are in the way that we don't need in order to make a proton, or protein, sorry, uh, where exons are expressed. And so we actually need to keep all the exons and we need to cut out all of the introns. Uh, well, with prokaryotes, they don't have introns and exons. All they have are only exons. They only All of their DNA is going to be used, except for the sections that are used for regulation. And so we're learning about the different important functions of the sections of DNA that are there regulating uh, the expression. So we think about a section of DNA inside of a prokaryote, there's going to be what we call a promoter region. And that is a section of the DNA sequence that is basically the binding site for RNA polymerase. So the polymerase making a polymer like, and what polymer is it gonna make? It's gonna make an RNA polymer. So this is the enzyme that's responsible for doing transcription, for reading the DNA and making an mRNA in the process of reading it. So uh, RNA polymerase is going to need a place to start as something that signals that this is the starting point of a gene, and that's what the promoter is going to do. It's going to promote transcription to occur in a specific location. Right next to the promoter, though, or immediately after it, though, is going to be what we call the operator. And the operator is the one in control. It's going to regulate transcription activity. It can either increase the chance of transcription activity by increasing the binding efficiency of the RNA polymerase to the promoter, so making it more likely that transcription happens, or it could be inhibited. So there could be a, a protein, for example, might be uh, bound to the operator at a specific location, and when the protein is stuck to that operator, it physically prevents RNA polymerase from moving forward along the DNA sequence, and so transcription can't happen because it's physically blocked. Okay, so RNA polymerase, if you're in this example, it could bind to this promoter, right? But, see here, this promoter right here, but because of this inhibitor that's bound to the operator, which is located underneath it, it cannot move forward, all right? It's impossible for the, for the RNA polymerase to go forward anymore along the DNA because there's just this physical protein that's getting in the way. Okay, if it gets past the operator, then it would be going on to the operon. And so we refer to sections of genes that are used in bacteria as operons. And so the example that we're talking about uh, here is actually called the lac operon. 
that the lac operon is referring to lactose. And so if you remember lactose and lactase, right? Lactose is the sugar, right? That isn't found in dairy products and milk and stuff like that. And lactase would be the enzyme that is responsible for digesting it. Now, bacteria, some strains of bacteria can actually digest uh, lactose by creating lactase and uh, using that enzyme to digest the sugars. However, lactose is not very common uh, in nature, right? It's not, unless the bacteria are living around a, a rental, rental source of, of sugar, of a dairy product, or put into dairy product, um, they're probably not gonna be running into lactose uh, often. So it's not really in the best interest of the bacterial cell to constantly be transcribing the genes for breaking down lactose uh, if there is any lactose around. And so what we're seeing here is this operator or this operon, sorry, is inhibited by the operator, by the protein that's stuck onto that operator. And the protein here isn't going to leave until lactose is present. And when lactose is present, this operator will, or this inhibitor will leave the operator. And then RNA polymerase will be able to move forward and produce three specific genes that are necessary, or three specific proteins, sorry, that are necessary for, um, uh, going through the process of breaking down lactose. So when we think about these specific proteins, they come from these three genes. We have LAC-Z, LAC-Y, and LAC-A. So let's say, for example, we're talking about E. coli. E. coli would be a bacterium that would, that would be uh, on, using the lac operon in this way. And so they want to break down lactose if lactose is present because there's two sugars in lactose. There's galactose and there's glucose. That's twice the amount of sugar that you can be using as an energy source. So it's a good idea to break down lactose. But as I said, if lactose isn't normally around, it's not really a good idea just to constantly be making a bunch of enzymes that aren't going to be used. It's just wasteful. So we don't want to have these genes that break down lactose being expressed unless lactose is present. So the operator is going to be inhibited by inhibiting protein, all right? And we can think of this as a silencer sequence. Basically, basically, it's silencing the expression of this gene. Even though the promoter region is present and the RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter, it's not going to be able to move forward. So the protein that's attached to it, we could refer to this as a repressor protein. It's repressing or trying to limit transcription in our uh, prokaryotic cells. And the thing is that being a protein, it also has a very specific conformation and has an active site. And so in that active site, if something binds to it in this specific location, right, there's a chance that the protein is going to change shape, and then if it changes shape, it will fall off of the DNA or fall off, fall off of the operator section, and then RNA polymerase will be able to move forward. And that's really essentially what's going to happen. So when normally the E. coli is not around lactose, so the normal condition is that the repressor protein is stuck to the operator, and so there is no transcription of this section of the DNA uh, until it's absolutely needed. And so that's what happens if we put it around lactose. And so lactose uh, it will need a relatively high concentration, but eventually lactose can get into the cell, right? It can get through the membrane. And when that happens, some of that lactose might end up binding to that active site of the repressor protein. And when it does that, it changes its shape and it ends up getting released from the DNA, right? So there's our lactose. And so when it releases the repressor protein, RNA polymerase now can be free to move through all of the genes and it gets to express these, uh, these three sections of the DNA that eventually create uh, the lactase enzyme. It also creates a transport protein, which will be there to help move the lactose into the cell. And then it also makes um, another series of molecules that help with the process of breaking down lactose, but we don't actually have a whole lot of information on, on what the third gene actually does just yet. So we think about comparing or looking at these types of proteins and looking at sequences found in eukaryotes versus our prokaryotes. So for example, we have something like a DNA sequence, we could have an enhancer, right? And so the binding protein, the thing that binds to an enhancer, we would call that an activator. So if we have an enhancer region, something that's gonna make transcription happen faster, we're gonna have an activator protein that's gonna stick onto that DNA and it's gonna basically increase the chance or the rate of transcription of a gene. So there could be prokaryotes and eukaryotes that are using enhancers in order to activate the DNA.
We could be looking at silencers, which would be using a repressor protein. This would be an example, would be the lac operon. So the lac operon has a repressor protein that is stuck to the operator, which is acting as a silencer, and it's stopping the transcription of the, um, the genes that break down lactose. And so um, this would just repressing or preventing the transcription rate. And then we could also have promoters. And so promoters actually increase the probability that RNA polymerase binds to the DNA. And so not only do you need a section of the DNA that can regulate how well RNA polymerase is doing its job, but you also need a promoter region that increases the probability that RNA polymerase will even attach to the DNA at that specific location so that it can continue on to go through the process of transcription. So using promoter regions, uh, silencers with repressor proteins or enhancers with activator proteins, those are just some of the basic levels in which transcription can be regulated uh, in prokaryotes and also a bit in eukaryotes. However, as you're going to see, eukaryotes are a little bit more complicated as well because they have other systems that overlap this system as well. So this is really what you would find in prokaryotes. In eukaryotes, you have stuff like this and you have some other systems as well. So as we move on <clears throat> to talk about how eukaryotes regulate their transcription, um, just like with the presence, the environmental factor of the lactose being around the E. coli, which caused a change in transcription and caused the operator, uh, the repressor protein on the operator to be released so that the genes could actually be transcribed. Um, eukaryotes are also heavily influenced by their environmental uh, the environment around them as well. So here's an example. When we think about environmental impacts, this could be like changes in the length of day. This could be things like temperature or pH or even just the amount of nutrition or the amount of water that something might be exposed to. And so here we have an example with our Himalayan rabbits here. And so we have pigments uh, in the Himalayan rabbits that are um, completely de are dependent on the temperature that the rabbits are surrounded by. So you see one version of the rabbit where um, they're very black nose and black feet and black ears, where the other version of the rabbit where those uh, features are significantly lighter. And so they are the, the same species. And what we're looking at is gene C, which is basically controls the amount of pigment, the amount of dark coloring that is present inside the rabbit's tissue. Now normally this gene is really active uh, in certain environmental temperatures, normally between 15 to 25 degrees. So at higher temperatures, the gene is inactive. So typically when it's around 15 to 25 degrees, the rabbit is going to possibly be in um, some colder conditions. And so uh, it's going to have a darker coloring. Uh, and so at low temperatures, the, the darker extremities, or the, the extremities like the ears, the nose and the feet uh, produce a black pigment. And so this is actually done because they are warm blooded in order to help them regulate their body temperature. So if you've ever heard before that black absorbs uh, sunlight better than white does, this, this is actually true. Black surfaces will absorb sunlight better than uh, a white surface, which will reflect it more often than, ab than absorb it. So the rabbits having their outermost parts, uh, their feet and their nose and their ears, uh, they have a circulation going through them to help maintain their body heat in those parts of their bodies. But uh, they can get a boost in terms of the, um, their body temperature by having these areas get darker so that sunlight that would be hitting them would make it a little bit easier for them to, uh, to absorb energy from the sunlight, absorb thermal heat, and therefore it would help with their body temperatures. When it's already pretty warm, they don't need to have um, these black extremities because it would mean it would be difficult for them to regulate their body temperature in the other way. They would be getting too hot. So at higher temperatures, uh, the pigment is actually uh, inhibited. And so uh, we get the pigment starts to fade away. And so we get more of a whiter color or like a grayish whiter color uh, so that they're actually better at reflecting light, which helps keep them cooler. So this is just an example where like temperature is going to have a major effect on transcription. So it's not just um, uh, promoters and repressors and, and things like that, but it's also environmental factors that can contribute a lot to what happens to uh, during transcription. We also have the environment uh, in a cell and around a cell uh, in different tissue layers are also going to have a major impact on gene expression. So here, looking at the development of a human fetus, and so there are all these different regions of the body that have to be created. We need to create a head, we need to create a tail, we need to create you know, arms, 
and legs, and then we need the tissue between uh, the little nubs that are the beginnings of our feet and our hands to start to e disappear so that we get the fingers and digits, right? So that we can actually, you know, have our toes and our fingers. And so there's a lot of regulation, there's a lot of change that's happening in different parts of the body. And so different parts of the genes, right? Different parts of your DNA are being used in order to develop those specific regions. And so only really a small number of genes are really needed to determine your basic body pattern. Uh, these are what we call our Hox genes. And we see that they're actually really consistent. Uh, Hox gene one is, is kind of creates a very similar body plan uh, throughout all of the different animals that contain it. And that really is the, the gene that kind of creates the beginning of what your head is going to be. And so these Hox genes kind of map out uh, where the different regions are going to go. Like where's your head going to go? Where's the neck going to go? Where's the different parts of the spine leading down to eventually um, the bottom of the, the digestive tract, which is located at the base of the animal, and then uh, appendages coming out at the base versus appendages coming out near the shoulders, near the head. And so all of these uh, uh, genes can be expressed and regulated by molecules that we call morphogens. And so these morphogens um, will diffuse uh, from a concentration, going from high concentration to a low concentration, and their effect on the cells and how the tissues develop is closely related to uh, their concentration gradient. So they have a stronger effect in an area where there's a very high concentration of them because they're being produced by something, and they'll have a slightly different effect later on uh, or further away from the source when it's a very low concentration. So by allowing these morphogens to just naturally diffuse across the space of the tissues of the organism, you know, as it's developing, uh, you get differences in gene expression just, be have, just because there, you have a high concentration of morphogens versus a low concentration of morphogens. So we can... Um, consider these morphogens to be what we would call transcription factors. And so transcription factors are basically proteins that are going to have an influence on how efficient a eukaryote is going to do transcription. So transcription factors normally are going to promote transcription. And so if we have more morphogens promoting transcription in the high concentration, we're going to have a lot of expressions of certain genes that are going to create a, you know, certain cell types and body parts and stuff in that region. And then if the morphogens are at a lower concentration further away because of diffusion, well, then we would expect a different a rate of expression, and so we get a slightly different body type. And so because of this, along with the idea of inhibition and activations of different genes uh, by other molecules that would be present, um, that's where you get the, like the length of your fingers or the nose on your face, or like different other uh, specific parts of your body's feature. It has to do a lot with these morphogen concentrations. So we have environmental factors, we have morphogens and their concentration gradients. And then the other one that you really need to know pretty well is inhibiting through the nucleosomes and how, how nucleosomes would uh, uh, basically increase or decrease the rate of transcription by making it easier or harder for DNA to basically unravel so that it can be used. So if you don't quite remember, the nucleosome is what happens when the DNA is supercoiled and packaged around a histone protein, right? the histone protein being those little pink spheres and the DNA wrapping around it. When DNA is wrapped around a histone, it's inactive. It cannot be used by RNA polymerase because it's too compacted. It's no way that RNA polymerase can get in there and start to open up the DNA and start making um, uh, a messenger RNA from the DNA. So by wrapping DNA around a nucleosome, you are in effect inhibiting it. However, uh, DNA, the stuff constantly moving inside of the cell, and DNA is going to be more loosely or more tightly packed around these histone proteins. So a nucleosome that is very tightly packed would be really strongly inhibited, so that would be a region of DNA that's probably never going to really be used where if you've got a loosely uh, wrapped nucleosome, then that DNA region could probably be, you know, be opened every once in a while, it's gonna stretch open, and then there would be an area that could go through transcription, more likely, because it's more easy for RNA to actually get access to that DNA. So when we go through the process, oh yeah, sorry, before we get it, nucleosome again, these are histone proteins, our octometers here, and they're kind of like just holding the DNA onto these octometers, kind of like thread around a spool. Now, when we think about how tightly packed we can create a nucleosome, that has a lot to do with two ideas, methylation and acetylation. So methylation is basically when you add a methyl group, and if you don't uh, have chemistry, a methyl group 
is basically CH3. That's methane. And so we add it to a, uh, a molecule, creating a methyl group. And so we can add methyl groups to DNA, specifically on cytosines. So also the amount of cytosine that is present also is going to influence how much methylation is going to occur. And so adding it to the cytosine, uh, the methylation, this happens on the outside. So methylating the DNA will actually start to inhibit transcription. Because during this process of, of um, methylation, uh, it enables the DNA to be more tightly round, wound around the histones and less likely to kind of loosen up and move away from the histone proteins. And so because the binding between the DNA and the histones is stronger, we would see that methylation would start to inhibit access to certain genes. And so this would eventually start to form what we call our heterochromatin, or the idea that the chromatin are the sections of DNA that are not going to be used. So if we see more methylation in a region of uh, the DNA, that probably means that that's a region that's not being used in the cell. Now, we also could have acetylation. And acetylation is when we add an acetyl group. And an acetyl group it basically gets added onto the histones, not onto the DNA, but onto the histones. And during the acetylation, this could actually promote transcription because basically what it is is the acetyl groups being kind of big, they get in the way as the DNA tries to wrap around the nucleosomes. And so since the DNA can't physically interact with the nucleosomes very well because of these acetyl groups are in the way, DNA is less uh, tightly wrapped, wrapped around the histones, which means having looser nucleosome formation, it's more likely that the DNA will start to open up and be more accessible to RNA um, RNA polymerase, and therefore uh, more likely transcription is going to happen. So we say that this would actually promote transcription because it makes the DNA more available. And so this would actually be the idea of euchromatin, the form of DNA that is actually used by the cell. So you should note, however, there are some instances or there's ways of thinking about it that both methylation of histones can also sometimes promote and inhibit transcription because sometimes in methylation, um, the methyl groups kind of get in the way preventing DNA from tightly wrapping around the histone as well. So it kind of goes both ways. It really depends on the amount of methyl groups present. So if there's a lot of methyl groups, sometimes all those extra amounts of methyls really prevent the DNA from tightly wrapping around the histones. But if there's a few methyl groups, that actually makes it more likely that they'll wrap around the histones tighter so that decrease in, is, um, decreases um, transcription or inhibits it. Uh, but in general, we would say that methylation will inhibit transcription or acetylation will promote transcription. So ultimately, this comes back to this idea of, well, what is regulating all of this transcription? So what is deciding what gets methylated? What is deciding what gets acetylated? And so those methyl groups and acetyl groups are being added to the DNA by enzymes that are specifically designed to do that. And those enzymes and their activity is going to be determined by their own transcription and translation so that they get created by proteins. So what it means is, is that since all the information for growing an organism and controlling all of this activity ultimately comes from the DNA, what we're seeing is genes are regulating other genes. So remember we talked about before how a lot of the DNA uh, is not actually used to make proteins, it's actually used for regulating all this activity inside of the cell. So it doesn't physically make a protein, but it might make something that is involved in the process of regulating something else. And so when genes are regulating other expressions of other genes, we call this uh, epigenetics. And so epigenetics is really an interesting area of, of biology right now. Uh, it's a growing field as we're learning more and more about how genes interact with each other. But acetylation and methylation, for example, are a form of epigenetic tags. And these are things that kind of get passed down from generation to generation. And so we should see certain methylation and acetylation um, properties uh, and themes showing up in offspring of another organism. So we kind of expect that maybe some of the reasons why we end up looking the way that you do isn't just necessarily the sequence of your DNA, but also the expression of those genes themselves, which ones are acetylated, which ones are methylated, or basically those epigenetic tags. Okay, so for example, if a new organism is to grow, it needs to be basically completely unmarked because it has to be completely open in order to develop into you know, uh, anything. So the, the idea of the stem cells, right? You have to start with a blank slate. You could be absolutely anything. 
and then slowly you start to develop into specialized cells. And when you develop into specialized cells, you're mostly going to be deactivating certain parts of the DNA and then promoting other regions of the DNA. So your stem cells, in order to start becoming into a nerve cell or a muscle cell in order to make tissue, muscle tissue and nerve tissue, they need to inhibit the parts of the DNA that aren't needed and they need to promote the parts of the DNA that they are. And so these epigenetic tendencies, these epigenetic tags of where methylation and acetylation are going to occur in order to create these, uh, these um, different tissues, uh, this is also being inherited as well. And so what we see basically is the reprogramming of the genome. Uh, and so if we erase these epigenetic tags, we kind of have a blank state, right? And so by adding these epigenetic tags, uh, you start to become more and more um, uh, like your parents or like the organism that you should be based on the combination of DNA that you had. So there's an interesting idea is that if we could erase these epigenetic tags, if we could remove them, could we go back and unspecialize cells? Could we take a normal cell and could we get it to go back to being a stem cell by removing the epigenetic tags where it's been um, methylated and acetylated to make it back to like a normal default cell and that's really where the idea of using stem cells in research is going it's how can we promote normal cells to go back to being stem cells in order to use them for um, medical benefits so leading into the concept of epigenetics and how methylation and acetylation ultimately leads to uh, very different expressions in terms of the environment and in terms of the individuals, we have a really great case study where we're looking at different methylation in different chromosomes uh, for monozygotic twins or basically identical twins. And so what we have here is that we've got the chromosome numbers, right? There we go. So we collected this information during metaphase of samples, and we had the chromosome numbers. So there are 23 chromosomes, but they've only here showing you uh, 1, 3, 12, and 17. And then they have this coloration that tells you different levels of methylation. And so they took the data when the uh, individuals in this study were 3-year-olds, and then we took the data as well when they were 50-year-olds. And so we're going to compare how did the 3-year-olds methylation patterns or epigenetic patterns reflect the patterns that we see in 50-year-olds. And so they have this color scheme that the computer is applying based on the amount of methylation. And so green areas are hypermethylated. So that basically means uh, high levels of methylation in one twin compared to the other. And it's sorry to see there, but yellow levels means that there's similar methylation levels between both twins. And red means hypomethylation, means low levels of methylation in one twin compared to the other. So that means that in, if the chromosomes are mostly yellow in color compared between each other, that means that they're the same. They're actually being used about the same amount. Uh, in green areas, we would see that if there's a green area for one twin, it might not necessarily be green in the other twin because one twin is being heavily methylated where the other twin is not necessarily being as highly methylated in that same region of the DNA. And the hypomethylation would mean the opposite, where there'd be very low levels of methylation in one twin compared to the other. So we would expect the green areas to be mostly inactive DNA because it's been hypermethylated, so it's our, our heterochromatin. And the red areas would be the euchromatin, right? That's the area that's being uh, more actively used. And then the yellow areas would be kind of a mix between both of the twins. So we're also looking at uh, the amount of use that those sections of the DNA are experiencing, and then whether or not it's being uh, shared with the twin. Is it, is it the same as the twin, or is one doing it more than the other? All right, so then if we look at this, we can kind of compare the, the sets of data that we have present uh, using these images and we can draw some conclusions. Imagine coming into the world with a person so like yourself that for a time you don't understand mirrors. As a child, when I looked in the mirror, I'd say, that's my sister. And my mother would say, no, that's your reflection. It's hardly surprising because you both come from the same egg. You have precisely the same genes. And you're literally clones, better known as identical twins. And yet, it's not uncommon for a twin like Anna Marie to get diagnosed with cancer, while the other, like Clotilde, doesn't. But how can two people so alike 
be so unalike? Well, these mice may hold a clue. Their DNA is as identical as Anna Marie and Clotilde's, despite the differences in their color and size. The human who studies them is Duke University's Randy Jurdle. So Randy, I see here you have skinny mice and fat mice. What have you done in this lab? Well, these animals are actually genetically identical. The fat ones and the skinny ones? That's correct. This gets even more mysterious when you realize that these identical mice both have a particular gene called agouti. But in the yellow mouse, it stays on all the time, causing obesity. So what accounts for the thin mouse? A tiny chemical tag of carbon and hydrogen called a methyl group has affixed to the agouti gene, shutting it down. Living creatures possess millions of tags like these. Some, like methyl groups, attach to genes directly, inhibiting their function. Other types grab the proteins, called histones, around which genes coil, and tighten or loosen them to control gene expression. Distinct methylation and histone patterns exist in every cell, constituting a sort of second genome, the epigenome. Epigenetics literally translates into just meaning above the genome. So if you would think, for example, of the genome as being like a computer, the hardware of, the, of, of a computer, the epigenome would be like the software that tells the computer when to work, how to work, and how much. In fact, it's the epigenome that tells our cells what sort of cells they should be. Skin, hair, heart, you see, all these cells have the same genes, but their epigenomes silence the unneeded ones to make cells different from one another. Epigenetic instructions pass on as cells divide, but they're not necessarily permanent. Researchers think they can change. And that brings us to the reason why we're showing you twins. In 2005, they participated in a groundbreaking study in Madrid. Its aim? to show just how identical, epigenetically, they are or aren't. Our genes are just part of the story. Something has to regulate these genes. And part of the explanation is epigenetics. Esteller wanted to see if the twins' epigenomes might account for their differences. To find out, he and his team collected cells from 40 pairs of identical twins age 3 to 74. Then began the laborious process of dissolving the cells until all that was left were wispy strands of DNA, the master molecule that contains our genes. Next, researchers amplified fragments of the DNA until the genes themselves became detectable. Those that had been turned off epigenetically appear as dark pink bands on the gel. Now, the genes from a pair of twins are cut out and overlapped. The results are far from subtle, especially when you compare the epigenomes of two sets of twins that differ in age. Here on the left is the overlapped DNA of six-year-old Javier and Carlos. The yellow indicates where their gene expression is identical. On the right is the DNA of 66-year-old Anna Marie and Clotilde. In contrast to the younger twins, hardly any yellow shines through. Their epigenomes have changed dramatically. The study suggests that as twins age, epigenetic differences accumulate, especially when their lifestyles differ. One of the main findings of our research is that epigenomes can change in function of what we eat, of what we smoke, of what we drink. And this is one of the key uh, differences between epigenetics and genetics.
So let's do some comparison. So we have variations in levels of methylation between the twins seems to be increasing with age. Is there evidence for this? Well, we again see them as the three-year-old in data versus the 50-year-old data. As three-year-olds, they have fairly identical levels of methylation, whereas they get older, there's less yellow regions and there's more increase in our red and hyper and hypomethylation. So hypomethylation occurs uh, more away from the ends of our chromosomes, so the more active sections of our DNA are located towards the middle of these chromosomes. Chromosome 3 shows a lot more variation in methylation between both ages. So the DNA banding patterns in chromosome 3 mean more, uh, seem more erratic compared to the other ones. And we also see in chromosome 17 uh, has probably changed the least, right? The banding patterns and the methylation patterns in year 3 versus year 50 seem to be less severely altered versus uh, as they've gotten older. So levels of methylation, both hyperlation, hypermethylation, and both hypomethylation seem to be increasing with age, uh, would be another conclusion we can make as well. So then we can also look at analysis and deductions, all right? So we could probably see here that the twins probably are having different experiences or environment stimuli. That's why they have different levels of methylation. Even though they started with almost identical methylation, right, the yellow regions when they're in uh, year three, as, uh, three years old, as they got to age 50, uh, their environmental stimuli has caused them to have different type of expression or different methylation levels in different parts of their chromosomes. They're not so different that, you know, they're not still twins, you know, they are twins, but their expression of their identical DNA isn't actually identical. So the DNA might be identical to each other, but the expression of that DNA is not. We also see that methylation inhibits transcriptions as the organism is aging. So cells are becoming greatly specialized, right? So we see more reds, right? So areas that are being uh, overexpressed versus greens and where things are being underexpressed. And so we're using less areas of the DNA as they got older and then they're more focusing on specific regions of the DNA as, as they grew older. Uh, we can also look at chromosome 3, it shows a lot more variation in both in methylation for both ages, where 17 uh, shows the least. So that's some other comparisons and things we could be making. And then we also see the number and the size and the roles of the genes varies between chromosomes. There's different genes on different chromosomes and they have different roles, different functions. And so it's not necessarily that, that chromosome 1 is going to have the most important genes and chromosome 17 is going to have least important genes. Uh, there's necessary genes for life spread evenly across our chromosomes. And so chromos there are genes in each chromosome that are important and are being continued to be expressed and overexpressed. Well, there are genes that are, are present in chromosomes that are also not as useful and become um, heterochromatin and become deactivated uh, as the individual starts to age. So now that we've talked all of that information about regulating of transcription, right? So we've got uh, enhancers, we've got silencers, we've got promoter regions, we've got our, our uh, morphogens and their concentration gradients, we have methylation, we have acetylation, all of these factors influencing transcription rates. Uh, I haven't actually talked to you about what transcription actually is. So now let's just summarize in general what tra what is happening during transcription inside of our cells. So. Transcription is basically when information inside the DNA is going to be converted into messenger RNA or mRNA. Uh, and this is mostly done uh, through base pairing. So if you remember A's bind with T's and G's bind with C's. So using RNA polymerase, RNA polymerase will base pair and will build an mRNA chain that is complementary to a DNA chain. Right? Then that DNA will then, or sorry, the mRNA will then leave the nucleus, go out into the cytoplasm or interact with the ribosome and go through the process of translation, which will read the mRNA in three base pair sections called codons and use those codon, uh, the codon code, right, in order to determine which amino acid goes first, which amino acid goes second, which amino acid goes third, and basically create the primary sequence, the primary level of uh, protein structure. So we're going to talk about translation in a lot of detail in another slide, another set of notes. So today we're just going to be focusing on what happens during transcription. So again, just to summarize all this stuff that we talked about earlier, DNA, remember, has coding and non-coding regions, and they could affect the transcription of mRNA. 
we have exons, which are going to be expressed, and we have introns, which are not going to be expressed and are in the way. And so we also have promoters that can attach and increase the probability of RNA -NA polymerase attaching. We have enhancers and silencers, enhancers increasing the rates of transcription and silencers decreasing the rate of transcriptions. And ultimately what's going to happen is that through these promoters and enhancers and uh, silencers, whatever exact transcription regulation is going to occur. At some point, we're going to go through the process of transcription. And it's actually fairly simple. So what will happen is RNA polymerase as one gigantic enzyme concept. All right, it's not like all of those enzymes that we needed during DNA replication. RNA polymerase is actually a fairly big, complicated organ or enzyme that can do a lot of different types of reactions all at once. And so what it's going to do is it's going to find that promoter region of the DNA, an area that actually does need to be transcribed, and it's going to attach to the DNA and it's going to start breaking the hydrogen bonds, kind of like helicase does, so that it can unwind the DNA, open it up, and get access to the DNA template. Then what it's going to do is it's going to start to synthesize the mRNA using base pairing rules. Now eventually, the, pre, this, the, the original part is the pre-mRNA, which still has all of those introns inside. And so before we can get to our mature mRNA, or the mRNA that actually gets used in translation, we have to cut out all of those introns and make sure all the exons are put together in the order that we need, uh, which we'll talk to you about in just a second. So eventually, this is going to create mRNA. Uh, this process can always be can also be used to make tRNA, which we'll talk about when we talk about translation. tRNA is another type of RNA molecule that's useful uh, for doing the process of protein synthesis. And we can also use this process to create rRNA, which is basically what ribosomes are made out of. So ribosomes, R stands for ribosomes. So ribosomes are actually made out of RNA as well. So mRNA, tRNA, and ribosomal RNA, rRNA, they're all going to be working together a little bit later when we get to the translation process of actually taking the information in DNA and using it to make a protein. All right, so now we're just going to focus on mRNA and what happens to it. So when we go through this whole process, RNA polymerase is going to have to bind to some part of the DNA, and typically it's the start of the gene. So we're going to find a promoter sequence which tells us this is a gene here that needs to be uh, going through transcription so that we can actually you know, get a protein out of it. Now, it's really important that you understand this concept of sense and antisense. So RNA polymerase is going to separate the DNA strand, and it's going to synthesize a complementary RNA strand by copying, or by base pairing, sorry, with the antisense DNA strand. So let me try to emphasize this. So here, look at this example down here. So the DNA sense strand is this one. That's the, the information that we actually need in order to make our protein, right? And so that means that we need to have a G, a T, an A, and a C as the beginning part of our sequence in order to make the correct protein. So the problem is, is that we can only build these things through base pairing. So if I were to use the sense strand in order to make my mRNA, I wouldn't get GTAC. I would get the equivalent to it. So I would get a C, an A, a U, and a G. But that's not correct. That's not the sequence that actually is going to make our protein. So I can't use the sense strand, the one that actually has the information, to make the mRNA. What I need to use is the antisense strand, the one that is on the opposite side of it. You see here the antisense strand has C, A, T, and G. And if I use my base pairing rules, that produces G, U, because thiamine is, we do thi or uracil instead of thiamine. So G, U, A, and C, which is the same, right, uh, pretty much as the sequence in the DNA sense strand. So RNA polymerase is not going to use the sense strand in order to make mRNA. It's going to use the antisense strand to make the mRNA because it has to base pair with it in order to build the new mRNA strand, the, the make this the strand of mRNA. But if it's done correctly, the mRNA will be exactly the same as the DNA strand that's in the sense strand, except all of the uracil, or all the thiamines will be replaced with uracil. Okay. So, 
Again, transcription is always going to be occurring in the five to three direction. We can't change this the idea that we have to use the three prime or the enzymes have to use the three prime in order to add new uh, nucleotides. RNA nucleotides operate under the same sense. So we're going to be increasing and moving down the antisense strand uh, building in a three to five direction. And this is going to be creating covalently bond uh, RNTPs. So just like we had DNTPs with the triphosphates, we will have RNTPs, right? So ribosome nucleotides that have triphosphates attached to them. And we'll be using our complementary base pairing rules in order to make sure that we put them all in the correct order, right? Eventually, RNA sequence is going to be synthesized. Once it gets to the end, there's a region of DNA that normally is very repetitive, uh, repeating, repeating sections of uh, thiamine, and that will tell the um, ribosome, or not ribosome, so it'll, take, it'll tell the RNA polymerase that it's, it's time to stop, or it reached the end of the gene. And so eventually the RNA polymerase will detach from the DNA, and then we'll also release the mRNA, and so the mRNA will then be free to move out of the nucleus all right, and go back and go into the cytoplasm so that it can be used in translation, which we'll talk about in the next series of notes. Uh, now that RNA polymerase is out of the way, the DNA is going to reform the double helix, making those hydrogen bonds between the two strands of DNA. Okay, and so then from there, transcription is technically complete. However, we might not have mature mRNA because remember there are introns in our DNA that we need to cut out in order to, you know, have the exons, the actual pieces of DNA that we need to make our proteins. So then we need to move on to the next step, which is to get rid of the introns. Now again, I want to emphasize that this is only in eukaryotic cells, okay? Only in eukaryotes. Prokaryotes, like bacteria, do not have introns. So basically what's going to have to happen is that when we have our pre-mRNA, there will be exons and introns and exons, and they'll be kind of intermixed between each other. So what we need to do is we need to make mature mRNA, which is RNA that is only comprising of our exons. So in order to do this, a really complex series of enzymes are gonna group together to create a large complicated machine called a spliceosome. And basically it is, it's like an enzyme, but it's a bunch of different proteins that are all working together. And so the exons are the ones we actually code for specific parts of the proteins. The introns are the non-coding regions that aren't needed. And so the introns are in the way. They need to be removed. So spliceosome is going to come along. It has a special system that it can use to recognize a sequence of an intron versus the sequence of an exon. And so it will basically form a little loop of the intron and cut it out and then take the two exons that were on either side of that intron and put them together and then eventually that intron will get broken down so that we can reuse the uh, the ribonucleic acid um, nucleotides so we can reuse those parts in order to make more mRNA. So once the introns have been removed that's when we have a mature mRNA that only has exons and then that will be used by the ribosomes in order to make our polypeptide. Now you're probably thinking that that sounds really goofy. Why do we even have exons and introns? It seems like we're spending, we're having a lot of work by having spliceosome come around and mess around with this mRNA. Why not be like bacteria cells and just have everything in the correct order uh, and have no issues and have no intron sections? Well, introns and exons actually, um, or introns being between exons actually have uh, a few benefits for us. First off, uh, mutations happen all right all the time um, the UV light causes mutations in your DNA once it you know moves and hits your cells going through the process of DNA replication uh, DNA polymerase is not a perfect machine it's really really efficient but it's not a hundred percent and so every once in a while it's gonna make a mistake now DNA polymerase 2 might catch that mistake and fix it but even DNA polymerase 2 can still make a mistake and so every once in a while, there will be a mutation that shows up in your DNA. If that mutation shows up in an intron, it doesn't matter because it's never used to make anything. It's not used to control anything. It's not used to make a protein. So it's what we call a silent mutation. It's a mutation that doesn't do anything to you. So it really doesn't matter that it exists. It doesn't affect any actual protein product. So having introns helps reduce the effects of mutations on our cells. The other benefit is by cutting up the mRNA this way and isolating specific sections, we can increase diversity through spliceosomes.
So we don't necessarily have to have all of the exons in the specific order and the exact number in order to get a functional protein. We can make different types of proteins that do slightly different jobs, right? We're talking about enzymes, right? There's tens of thousands of different enzymes. You have an enzyme that breaks down maltose, right? But then you also have an enzyme that breaks down sucrose. So maltose and sucrose are both disaccharides. Maltose is made out of two glucose. Sucrose is made out of a glucose and a fructose. So the enzyme that breaks down maltose and the enzyme that breaks down sucrose are not going to be exactly the same. However, they might be similar to each other because their exons are the same, except they're slightly different in different order or a slightly different number. So for example, if this was the enzyme necessary for breaking down maltose, it would be maltase, and this might be the enzyme for breaking down um, sucrose uh, here, for sucrose. So the difference might just be uh, this this number three here. So by cutting that out, we still get a functioning enzyme, it does its job, and now it's slightly different. So it will break down a slightly different um, molecule instead of maltose, it will break down sucrose. So by doing this, it increases the diversity, the experimentation that a cell can go through. Uh, I tell students, try to think of this in terms of like Legos, right? So you know, you don't necessarily need to have exactly the same pieces of Legos uh, in the exact order in order to create something that looks like a house or like functions, you know, as a car. There are different ways that you can make the same thing and still have it work and you get slightly different features. So by using different Lego pieces in different places and different orders, it enables you to be kind of experimental with how you want to design your Lego car. Proteins aren't really that much different. By mixing the exons up, by removing some, by putting them in different orders, cells are able to experiment with different ways of making proteins and ultimately they might end up making something that's even better than the original. And so they end up uh, keeping that new protein that they kind of created uh, through these random experimentations. So that's really one of the other benefits of having exons uh, um, in our DNA. Okay, uh, yeah, so there. So uh, that's all of the material so far uh, for 7.2. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let me know.